So we're going to begin functional medicine. This is going to be a patient's approach. I'm Melissa Talwar. I am a board certified functional medicine health coach. I also have additional training in functional medicine, nutrition, and neuroscience. And we've put this together uh, so that we could test this platform. So I figured this was the best way to go about it. When it comes to functional medicine, functional medicine determines how and why illness occurs, and then it restores health by addressing the root causes of disease for each individual. And you can go to the Institute of Functional Medicine, which is ifm.org, and you can learn more about functional medicine. I will say after doing all of this research that they need to add some more patient resources. I went to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, they have much more resources for patients to use, but there is a section on the functional medicine website for patients as resources. And then of course, finding a practitioner will go through as well. Now, why do people go over to functional medicine or why is this even becoming something that's talked about uh, recently? And with functional medicine, providers can either be MDs, NDs, DOs, chiropractors, and healthcare professionals really focus on this whole body medicine. They're trained in root cause medicine, and they're going to be looking at what we call ATMs or antecedents, triggers, and mediators. They look at lifestyle factors, health history, and genetics. They generally have lengthier intakes as well, so that's something that's an incentive for a lot of patients is they want more time with their providers. Another reason why is for a lot of people, if you are not interested in going to through the medication route or you want to reduce your medications, or if you are like some of us, we have some side effects to medications, this is what's really driving people more towards functional medicine. Now, providers can't figure out or if providers in your life can't figure out what is going on or your tests are normal, like many of us here in the fibromyalgia community, or you've ran run out of treatment options, this is something that drives people to functional medicine as well. Now, a recent study by ARNET, the Autoimmune Research Network, surveyed about 20,000 patients and found that it takes an average of four to five years to achieve a diagnosis and an average of four different physicians, which points to a growing number of individuals. So it takes that long just to get a diagnosis. And that's why I think these other avenues of medical models are being established because we have to we have to rethink medical treatment as much as we can and we're seeing these blends of allopathic traditional standardized naturopathic medicine and even integrative medicine come into the fold now people ask me the differences between functional medicine and integrative medicine and i have to be honest i get confused i think the terminology gets switched quite a bit there are similarities and if you talk to who Different people, they'll give you a different answer, which gets confusing. Now, functional medicine seems to seek out and understand and address biological root causes, while integrative medicine aims to heal mind, body, and spirit. Although in some of my slides, you'll see that there's that just isn't the case. So there is, it's very confusing. And I think in the end, what happens is the patient gets confused. So knowing this moving forward is there's going to be a different answer and you're going to go with what works for you. So it's all about the patients, uh, empowering the patients to find out what works best for you. And do ask a lot of questions because it is very confusing out there. I went to multiple people and looking at this research, they all have different answers for us. The big thing, a uh, number one question is, how do I find a functional medicine provider? So at ifm.org, the F Institute of Functional Medicine's website, you can click on that top button and you click and find a practitioner. So this is a search functionality. You can put in your state, zip code, and you can locate a functional medicine provider potentially in your area. You can also hit the advanced settings to look for specific keywords. So for the search that I did, I looked for functional medicine practitioners that specialize in fibromyalgia. So I used a fibromyalgia keyword and put in the state of California. And these were the results I got. So 88 different results with different providers. And as you can see, these providers all have different backgrounds. So we have a DO in the mix. We have an RN, acupuncturist. There's also an MD. And then I'm not sure what the person, the provider is and what there is in the second slot. So I'm going to have to learn more and see. So you can see how there's a variety of people 
that you might have to look for and you're going to have to do some investigation whether this is the correct person for you. And then additionally, you can look at their profiles and see more advanced training in there and the lists in the IFM coursework. I will say that if people have invested in a lot of coursework, it does cost a lot of money. And I don't want this to be the end all like uh, elitist attitude of functional medicine either for us patients. There are a lot of amazing providers out there who aren't necessarily trained in functional medicine. And one of my cons for functional medicine as a health professional, it's expensive. So if you do see a provider that's invested in all this coursework, they've put a lot of money into the learning modules of this. So that's why, unfortunately, it might create some example marketing where they have to recoup their costs. But this is just something to note. But it doesn't mean that other providers are any less because they haven't been able to get this training. Everything costs money at the IFM and it's super expensive to get the training that you might need. And it is extra advanced training. So this isn't like a medical school where people go through years of training. This is more of an extension, so a specialization in functional medicine after they've already gotten their medical licenses. When it comes to functional medicine, this is the famous functional medicine tree. And what we're talking about when we talk about addressing root causes rather than symptoms, we become oriented to identifying the complexity of diseases. So diseases you'll see manifest on the top of the tree. And we may find in functional medicine that one condition has different causes. And likewise, one cause may result in many different conditions. So as a result, functional medicine treatment targets the specific specific manifestations of disease in each individual. And you'll see as you go to the roots, there's going to be a lot of modifiable lifestyle changes where the patients can be empowered to really make a difference. And this is what we'll dive into when we talk more about a patient's approach. There's also these ATMs that we talk about and the genetic factors that come in. And if anyone's a vegetable gardener, you know your plants need nutrients, water, sun, but all these insults, like it gets too hot, it's really hot, will affect your plants, and you see it starting at the top. You see disease manifest out in the leaves and the system, and then when you dive deeper, you might notice the root systems. Once you pull things out, they're not getting enough nutrients through the roots. So this is kind of the concept of root cause medicine. And at the bottom of the tree is the personalizing lifestyle and environmental factors. These are modifiable lifestyle factors that have a tremendous impact on health or wellness. So these are things on like how well you sleep, your current approach to food, whether there's movement in your life, how you manage and handle stress, and then what is the nature and connection to others. Really dive in to look and start to reflect on how you can impact your own health in these categories, rather than necessarily looking at what the provider can do. And this is really the relationship when you dive into functional medicine, because these providers will start talking about lifestyle changes and looking to empower the patients to do more in order to affect their health. Here's the aspect of the functional medicine matrix when you do go see a provider who's drilling down to ask you all of these lifestyle questions, and they'll integrate this with the functional medicine timeline as well. So what you want to see is looking at examples of how the system works. So we have predisposing factors like genetics, environmental factors. Were you growing up in an agricultural setting? Were there toxins involved? Did you grow up on a military base? How were you exposed initially as a child to anything that maybe you didn't have control of? So we can't change our genetics, but genetics aren't necessarily our destiny. So these are things, although there is some manipulation coming out in science with genetics, which is fascinating. And then any of these triggering events, so these activators, did you have a surgery, infection, trauma, really heavy duty exposures to toxins? that created this sort of tipping point. Some people can't identify this, but others can. And we're going to see this a lot with long COVID. So people that got infected with long COVID will now have this starting point, or COVID will now have this identifiable tipping point that tipped them over into chronic illness. And how we solve that, how we treat that is currently in the works, but that should be 
in their medical history and not be discounted. And then if you do have fibromyalgia, you got sick with COVID, you've seen an exacerbation of your symptoms. Please continue to let your providers know about it. Do not let them discount it or sweep it under like it's just your fibromyalgia. Then you have some of these contributors that keep lighting the fire of the symptoms and keep it going. These contributors, they keep symptoms going. And this could be anything from poor sleep, chronic stress, uh, poor nutrition, and then just ongoing toxin exposures. Then with the medical history, what we're trying to see is all of this dialed in. This is why I was like, I negate the integrative medicine because you are looking at this spiritual mind, body, medicine, and organ systems. So unfortunately, standard of care, we jump from specialist to specialist treating different organs, and we're missing the fact that they're all connected. So this is why we address this in functional medicine. So we're looking at the immune system, how it affects the whole body system, neurotransmitters, uh, structural health, if you have a structural injury, how it might affect other organ systems. So as an example of how these systems work together and contribute to dysfunction, someone diagnosed with fibromyalgia may not only have pain, right? We don't just have pain, but we also have fatigue, loss of energy, and some of us have decreased exercise intolerance. So this is where energy kind of ties in. So energy regulation, we talk about mitochondrial function, and then also abnormal kind of hormone levels. We hear this a lot with thyroid, or as you're even going into possibly perimenopausal, menopause, there's all these shifts in hormones which can affect even your melatonin or cortisol levels, sleep-wake cycles. So that's the communication function. You see endocrine system, neurotransmitters, how this affects your immune messengers. Then we look at digestive issues, the, the bloating, the IBS. So this is the assimilation and how it just affects the digestion. And we can't just say gut health because there's so much more happening with the digestive system. I can vouch for that. My, my friend, the gallbladder got removed. So do not discount the gallbladder. Uh, do preventative measures because gallbladder can connect with thyroid dysfunction. It's an indicator if you've been untreated for thyroid dysfunction, you might be getting a lot of digestive issues so that we connect the dots. And then there's structural integrity. If you do have an injury, musculoskeletal injury, back injury, pinched nerves, anything like that, it's going to affect the whole system. Brain fog is a combination or a lack of ability to concentrate. You have energy and communication dysfunction. So all of this together, the understanding is that it's going to affect your ability to handle everyday life. And then at the bottom of the matrix, this is why we integrate this together, is those modifiable lifestyle factors. So you have sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, nutrition, um, is it sleep? stress, stress management, and then of course, relationships. And we'll dive into a little bit that more, but that's where you can make the most impact as a patient. The functional medicine timeline is a graphical representation that allows clinicians to identify factors that predispose, provoke, and contribute to pathological changes. And oh, I forgot to say in the beginning of this, I'm going to share with anyone that's registered these handouts. So I'll put it in a Google Drive. Feel free to get that link. If you don't get it, I will send it to everyone. And you can download this material. I also have a vitality timeline where you can fill out your own timeline because we're looking at various history points, how something was accumulated bo before getting chronic illness. So did this start earlier on in age? Were you having growing pains? Anything happening with childhood that might have just added up? Are you around a lot of stress constantly? So your bucket of stress is so full that when you had something happen, and it could easily be like a move someone passed away or you began being a caregiver and it got extremely stressful that you started to have really manifest chronic illness symptoms and the disease impact got really large for you. So in the functional medicine timeline, we begin with where you're born, who were your parents and grandparents, any pregnancy history, because some people notice fibromyalgia onset too after they uh, are pregnant and deliver. So there's a lot of changes that go on that don't get necessarily addressed. 
Uh, were you breastfed or bottle fed? We learn about the childhood adult illnesses, how they were treated, and even family dynamics dynamics. Genetically, if you know information, um, you can add that in there and how it possibly contributed to the illness. Then we have, you can add in modifiable lifestyle changes so you can see where there were significant areas of imbalance uh, that exist. And there's no shame. We're learning through this. There's a lot of marketing at us, especially when it comes to eating sugar. Uh, I love, I have a sweet tooth, so there's no shame in what we've now have learned and created awareness for. So you might want to indicate these changes because I remember uh, being an athlete in my younger days. I sure was not adding in nutrition after the games. So I was scarfing down a lot of sugar after I had just run out all my energy on the sports fields. So these are something to consider and, it, you know, how it contributed potentially now that you have some more learning and awareness behind uh, some of the lifestyle changes you may need to have to implement in your life. Now, I can't say that there aren't any cons to functional medicine. People in the functional medicine community always ask me, why would you talk about the cons? And again, I'm a patient first. So I've been a fibromyalgia patient since I was a teenager. So I want to make sure patients understand what they're getting into. There are no absolutes. There's no perfect medical system, and there's no absolutes to finding the cure for fibromyalgia. If I had the cure, I guarantee I would be sharing with you nonstop, constantly. There are things and things that help people manage their fibromyalgia, which is something we're really working hard at the organization to share with you as far as an education standpoint. And we're going to keep that content. And I love to hear from people if stuff works. But there's no absolute one thing that works for everyone. And so their system's going to be designed as such. And watch out for any of these biases. All of us as healthcare professionals will have a bias. My bias is brain health and nutrition because that is what worked for me. It used to be gut health, but the brain is very powerful to actually manifest disease. And I'm not saying, and with inflammation and pathophysiology and how it connects to the nervous system. And then nutrition really did help me. So this becomes my bias and all providers will have some sort of bias and they'll have some stigma related to fibromyalgia beforehand. So keep that in mind when you are looking for providers. One of the biggest barriers I've noticed with functional medicine is the higher out-of-pocket costs. I want to acknowledge that you may have to pay a cost to see the provider itself, supplements, there is specialized testing involved. And in the end, some people will argue that it might save you money in the long run if you can start to feel better working with this type of provider. But I want to acknowledge that there's a risk and an investment involved. And we really need to be active patients and communicate with each other in and avoid those absolutes. So if you do have a provider that you really like and enjoy with, please do share with the community if they're open. And then also be a patient advocate in the room itself and talk to your provider because what you're really looking for is an honest conversation. If you can't afford all of this specialized testing or that supplements, that provider, share that with the provider. And what you're looking for is someone that gives you room to not have to do all of that. Keep an eye out too for any of these specialized testing that you might have to do before you even see the provider. That's not really the basis of functional medicine. Functional medicine acknowledges that we all are unique. So we have to have a personalized approach and we need to do a full medical history before we decide on the testing. So you can push back and I do advise people to push back on some of these specialized testing because we don't have enough information and it's still a snapshot in time. So if you're having gut health issues, you might, if there's an affordability, if you have money to spend, then all the power to you to use some of these specialized testing. I thought I had to do it, especially for all of these GI maps. It was interesting information to get, but in the end, it was a snapshot of time. I was having major gut issues. So of course the tests are going to reflect that. I have inflammation. I had some autoimmune bacteria. I have imbalance. Well, duh, like my gut was awful. 
But did I necessarily need that to make the lifestyle changes I needed to do? No. So I went off and I did a lot of nutrition. I gathered that information in and it that made a difference. So of course, if I were to test afterwards, yeah, I'm going to get a different test result because I've already worked on those lifestyle changes. So you don't necessarily need this. And I know that's going to be a hard conversation potentially with the provider, but affordability is huge. And again, here is my bias. If you can work through some of the nutrition and instead of maybe spending $400 on one of those specialized tests, invest in higher quality nutrition, maybe a high speed blender. I would recommend doing that and instilling some of the lifestyle changes. If you are struggling, if you've done a lot of nutritional changes and nothing is working, that's maybe a sign where you can get some of these advanced testing to figure it out. These specialized testing. There is a specialized testing with Lyme disease that that's different. I would encourage you to make sure that you do not have Lyme disease, but there's some stuff with like gut testing, checking to see if you have gluten sensitivities. I guarantee you will know if you have a gluten sensitivity right away. Um, so keep that in mind with the affordability because testing is not agreed upon across the board at any of the functional medicine institutions. It's not, uh, training is not standardized. So this is also something to keep in mind, depending on who your provider, how they're trained, they have different, um, protocols for functional medicine, we need to create more standardized ways of doing this because when there are MDs, they go through medical schools. So there's pros and cons. This could fall into either pros and cons, depending on how you look at it. We also There's no way also to verify right now whether someone did get functional medicine training. I have seen buzzwords used and I hear people say they're functionally medicine trained, but sometimes when their clients actually actually approach me as a health coach, I walk them through the timeline and I'm noticing why it's a little strange to me because they immediately get the diagnosis of fibromyalgia and it's not approaching it from a functional medicine standpoint. So keep an eye out for that because again, ultimately in functional medicine, we identify that people are bio biologically different and unique. There's no blankets, blanket cross of diagnosing you for fibromyalgia. Uh, even with the protocols, I know I talk about different protocols like the Walls Protocol. We all know that it can be personalized. So understand this when you're approaching providers. Also, different functional medicine providers have different backgrounds. Not everyone can prescribe medications. So if you are looking to adjust your medications, please keep that in mind uh, because some people are not trained. They're trained in functional medicine, but they don't have the background to understand medications. So if you are on a lot of medications and you want to decrease, you're going to look for providers that have some medical training. So there are medical providers, MDs that do have functional medicine training, uh, DOs, and some NDs can work in certain states. It varies. NPs. So look out for that as well because health coaches, I can tell you across the board, I know there's a lot of health coaches that are running tests. It's very deceptive. I am not allowed to prescribe medications to you. Uh, so that is not within my scopes. But there's some funky language going on with functional diagnostic nutritionist, they cannot prescribe medications. I just have a knowledge based on biohacking, but do work and find the right provider that can help you with that if you are on a list of medications and you are trying to work yourself off of them. Another con, which is both pro and con, is working with a functional medicine provider. They'll ask you to make lifestyle changes. So if you are only interested in, you know, you want to just take a medication, you don't want to look at nutrition, you don't want to talk about sleep, functional medicine is not the right avenue for you. And another thing to note, functional medicine providers may not be in your area. It's something, too, that they're looking to expand more on. And if you do have questions, please, please post in the chat. Okay, I'm seeing some stuff in there. So Robert, I'm so sorry that there's been a crash. Hello, Narelle from Australia. But if anyone has any questions, do post those in the chat. There's a Q&A section or just the chat as we move forward. But I hope that's helpful in understanding, again, with absolutes, yes, I'm trained in functional medicine, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to know the pros and cons for every medical system and how it can integrate together 
and how you can work with various providers to get the benefit full health for yourself as a patient. I'm going to bring it back to the matrix because we're talking about lifestyle changes, sleep, relaxation, exercise, and movement, uh, especially when it comes to movement, nutrition, um, more of this stress and relationships and see if you this feels like what resonates with you when it comes to starting your health goals because this will be a big thing to just reflect on and think about and stuff that you can do on your own. So what feels good in starting this process for you as we move into these modifiable lifestyle changes? Like what type of thing can you do with sleep hygiene? Do you need to work on medications with sleep related or would you like to add more supplements in? So that's how you're working with a provider, but you will be asked to do some sleep hygiene work uh, when you're working with a functional medicine provider. They are going to say to contribute to movement, but I want you to explore movement that brings you joy. Throw out, I actually should cross out exercise because that's a very jarring word for me. Walking is wonderful. Play. I talk about play a lot. Have fun. Enjoy time with your pets. If you have a furry friend, they love to play with you. So go play. If you have kids, grandkids, play. Remember the days where we were all playing, we would do hopscotch our jump rope. Like remember those days of having fun and that's what we can do movement and add it in. It doesn't have to be going to the gym. doesn't have to be sitting on the floor to do yoga movements. If you hate some particular movement, just remember you don't have to do it. Find stuff that brings you joy. Nutrition. What do you visualize as nutrition for yourself? What does it mean to you to be eating healthy? And I want to throw away any stigma that comes up with this. Nutrition is not about losing weight. And unfortunately, that's the way it tends to be marketed. It is not about that. If you're looking at adding in more nutrition, what does that look like for you? If you're eating on a budget, what does that look like for you? Everybody across the board is going to be different. And we have to accept that. I want you to share the knowledge though on what works. Some people notice that they might actually do better with raw food. Others of us don't. Some of us may have tried keto or, you know, there's so many varieties of things that you can incorporate. Again, find what brings you joy when it comes to that and don't add stress. A lot of people get stressed out with nutrition. It's not about losing weight. It's not about buying a whole bunch of organic food and then not eating it. Uh, it contributes a lot to the stress component. And if you are stressed and figuring out nutrition, that is not going to add to anything. You'll have to, more digestive issues. You'll have more sleep issues. So how can you mitigate some of this stuff without paying attention to the stigmas out there? Throw that away. Be kind to yourself find things that really you enjoy. Now, relationships is one of the hardest categories for me. I will admit that. But if you are looking for, and what they mean by that is how do you find support if you are looking to add in new healthy lifestyle changes, who can be your accountability partner in this? Do you have a partner that you can cook with and eat with and walk with? Some people do. Some people have family members. You go out and play and you move around and you guys cook together as a family. That is a wonderful aspect of bringing health. There's people checking in with you. They hug you. Now, for people that might not have that strong relationships, which I will fully admit that I do not. Uh, you might have to look for other ways to have accountability in your life and reach out to the community. I love our community. It may be online. Maybe you reach out to support group leaders. We have some wonderful support group leaders in the group where we can look add those things in and be like, hey, do you mind if I just keep checking in with you? Or maybe we can brainstorm a little bit on ideas recipe ideas, use those relationships wherever they come from in order to invoke some of this joy and continue with these lifestyle changes. One thing I forgot to talk about too within functional medicine, that there are options just like concierge services that you've seen from primary care physicians. There are membership 
membership options and companies that instill functional medicine where you can pay monthly or yearly for and you get a package deal. It's kind of you get a doctor, nutritionist and health coach wrapped up in one. That might be something to consider. You can potentially get reimbursed. I am learning this through work as a health coach when we're partnered up with a clinic. These clinics are trained in functional medicine and they do offer reimbursement now. Working really, really hard to get this covered in insurance. There is some success there in understanding the billing system. So that is, and there are there are practitioners that will really try to help you in managing this and then also getting some lab tests at least covered through insurance. So there's ways to work it if you still want to add more of functional medicine to your life. And then of course, don't forget that you can work with a primary care physician, specialist, and functional medicine provider all at the same time. We do love the primary care. This is where fibromyalgia is headed as rheumatologists can help diagnose you but they're deferring you to primary care physicians. We do need to strengthen this area. We are working hard to do medical education for this area because I understand primary care is all over the country. You may not be able to afford functional medicine training. That's okay. Um, but we're going to give you some more education in fibromyalgia and primary care can provide quality care. And that is possible. And that's what we are going to move towards. As patients, we can push for this and we'll work together to push for this. But primary care can still refer you to specialists. They can do the blood work in advance. You'll need a medical workup. If you've gone through an intense medical workup and you're still not figuring out, that's where you might be able to brainstorm more with a functional medicine integrative or naturopathic provider and then addressing general health concerns. So we're not saying to replace your primary care provider in any way. Uh, but these are things to keep in mind. I have talked in other videos about just basic lab panel tests. So this is stuff that you can get covered within fibromyalgia uh, to make sure that you aren't missing anything. So this is another thing that I see sometimes. And especially with the general like overview approach, sometimes with fibromyalgia experts, they forget basic blood test chemistry panels. You really want to make sure that you have this. And if you find a provider is skipping this or ignoring it, just give them a reminder or make Maybe that provider may not be the right provider for you. And knowing who this is, functional medicine gets pitched a lot of times. So they may not even understand basic blood test chemistry panel, but you want to get these basic uh, chemistry panels done, these lab tests or even imaging. Uh, I did add Lyme testing here because it's, it's, it's something that's developing. I'm happy about to make sure that you don't have Lyme disease underneath it. You're looking also for celiac disease, doing these testings with structural uh, sleep testing, checking for any fasting glucose, A1C, liver panels, thyroid. So all of this is in here. Sedimentation rate, C-reactive protein, are your inflammatory protein? So this is why if it's high, you might get referred to a rheumatologist. Primary care can check for the ANAs, rheumatoid factors. Again, if you're seeing those at higher levels, you might get referred to a rheumatologist to do more investigation. Physical exam is really important aspect of this. And if someone, I know with the pandemic, it's it's changed things a lot. I love virtual care, but we cannot negate for a physical, a good physical examination as a fibromyalgia patient. If you haven't had one, um, please definitely do that just so you can re-verify we're talking about fibromyalgia here and making sure the provider hasn't missed other correlations or patterns if you have a family history of anything, especially neurological with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, ALS, you will want to make sure that this provider knows what they're doing when they come to a physical examination because you'll people, especially if you have imbalances, you're noticing dizziness, a lot of vertigo, um, looking at your gait, you'll want the provider to monitor any of this balance. You'll look at your strength. Some of us lose strength even in our hands if we're dropping stuff or if you are the type of person that tends to walk into the side of the wall, you see the doorway, but for some reason, in your your shoulder hits the doorway it, it's something to look i know we kind of diagnose ourselves maybe as clumsy we use these words but there's something going on there head injuries 
PTSD, there's dysfunction in the brain that might be translating to the nervous system and your musculoskeletal system. So have a provider do a good physical exam, um, looking at the gait, swelling of joints. This is a good opportunity to showcase any of that. If you have joint swelling, there's more investigation that needs to be involved as well. Um, also, blood pressure. If you tend to, if you get up really fast and you notice your blood pressure has dropped, have them measure your blood pressure lying down and then standing up and see if you have a significant drop in blood pressure. Pulse oximetry, temperatures is also something to measure. Make sure that your provider is doing this so they can see what is actually happening. Tremors as well comes up. So if you hold your hands out and you're noticing one hand may be getting shaky, this is also a big deal to notice and not get dismissed. Interesting story. I was in a health coaching group and the woman on screen, I didn't recognize and I felt bad at first, but she had this shaking and I, I kept, I'm like, I feel bad because I'm kind of staring, but what is happening? And I didn't know if she was nodding her head. And so I pulled in the provider to ask questions and she had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia and Hashimoto's. But I kept seeing this in the virtual, in my Zoom room, and I had to ask the provider, just double check. I was really, really scared to bring this up because I was very embarrassed, but I wanted the provider just to take a look, and she did, and she reached out to the patient. The patient was actually getting these minor seizures at the time. She didn't recognize it. She was diagnosed with MS, but you see these things, and I noticed it on camera. So if your provider is not paying attention to this stuff, we're going to like really miss a lot when it comes to getting the diagnosis with fibromyalgia. So look at these things. Don't let them dismiss you if you are tracking um, this type of information because it is super, I mean, it's not fibromyalgia. Um, and then just for education purposes, there are newer guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology. So they do not require a tender point exam. We are looking at widespread pain throughout the body for at least three months. So you want this provider to double check your left upper region, like your shoulders, arms, and jaws, the right upper region, um, and then left lower region. So including the hip, buttocks, and leg, right lower region, and axial region which includes the neck, back, chest, and abdomen. You want to get this full exam. Um, despite being diagnosed with fibromyalgia, always checking, and especially if you have a health history in your family, we are learning so much more about Parkinson's disease and noticing it before it develops into a full disease, especially with month muscle rigidity, gut health, and all of those things. So keep that in mind as you're getting your exam. Okay, I'm trying to go through this as fast as possible. Um, when it comes to functional medicine too, these are some of the nutritional things they might talk about. And if anyone's interested in getting some of these uh, maps or content, I'd be happy to send it to you. Just let me know which one intrigues you. So the foundational interventions are the core food blends, and they have this available for both vegans and vegetarians. There is a phytonutrient spectrum uh, just nutritional guide as well. And so this is talking about eating the rainbow. So having colorful plate of food, then one of the other first steps of intervention is the cardiometabolic food plan. So you'll see providers put you, maybe suggest this if you are looking to lose weight, lower your fasting glucose, uh, affect your blood pressure. These are sort of good places to start and they're not very restrictive in the nutritional um, side. There is also the elimination diet. If you are having a lot of sensitivities to food, this is something that might be suggested for you and functional medicine has a plan. I will say that elimination diet and the advanced therapeutic interventions are a temporary thing. If you've been left on it forever, I warn you that it's like temporary fixes. So something else may be going on. If you've been doing this for six months and you potentially could be starting to get nutritionally deficient. So this stuff is generally used temporarily to see. Now with the mito food plan, that's more of a ketogenic approach. Some people do love to live in keto. Um, or some people adopt keto early on and then they move into more of a paleo version. 
Then there's the detox version of this. So detox is more about reducing food triggers. You're going to support the liver function. They'll emphasize eating clean and organic. And we're targeting nutrients and antioxidants that will affect the phase one, phase two, phase three of the liver detoxification. Those are going to include a lot of sulfur-rich foods. But if you notice that you have a lot of sensitivity to those types of foods or you're the type of person that smells, when someone is cooking broccoli or eggs, do you note that to your provider before they add in some of these dietary changes with some of the sulfur-rich foods? Then there's the FODMAP. The FODMAP gets a lot of attention in fibromyalgia. There was a research study that showed its benefits to fibromyalgia patients because of um, helping with IBS. It's well known for that and any digestive issues. So it showed that it actually decreased levels of pain in fibromyalgia. That is one of the research study that was promising. It needs to be redone with a higher cohort of patients. Um, again, it's temporary. You can't live on that restrictive amount of food. It's not necessarily the best because you will become nutritionally deficient or you might be hating life. If they tell you that you can't eat anything, um, that doesn't work. That is not great and it adds more stress and that is no fun because then you'll just, you might end up giving up and then you're going to just go back and eat food because you're so fed up with what the doctor has told you. So keep that in mind. You want to per personalize it. Everything in nutrition can be personalized. You might start with a foundation. Um, so you might start with a core food plan of reducing sugars or reducing carbohydrates that are refined. So you're eating more vegetables. That's okay to start there. And then you can add and um, make it your own as you go along with it. So really do have some fun with it. Here's just the phytonutrient spectrum of foods. I encourage people to have fun with nutrition, add new foods in, explore vegetables, explore leafy greens. If you've never tried arugula in your salads or cabbage, that's something you might be interested in just experimenting with to see how it tastes or adding arugula to your smoothies. There's a lot of diversity in there. Arugula does add some detoxification benefits. Leafy greens are so beneficial for different vitamins and nutrients. And it also kind of just as you explore these, you add things in, you might actually need some less supplements if you are having a full supplement ca uh, cabinet. Supplements are supplemental. So the encouragement here is to eat a variety of colors of food and have fun if you have a family. I mean, this is something to maybe do and play games with, like what you, can you add to your meals? And then same with spices and herbs. So turmeric adds a lot of color, ginger and flavors, really good anti-inflammatory nutritional properties. Then we have like sleep hygiene. So again, these are foundational things that the provider is probably going to ask you to work on for better sleep. And as if you are having trouble with pain, somnia, which is really, really hard to treat, do address it. Don't negate it if you're having high levels and it's interrupting your sleep. It's important to talk about a provider. If you have already done a lot of the sleep hygiene techniques, um, working through that with your provider and seeing where there are areas for improvement for pain management is going to be important. But there's a lot of different things that you can do for sleep. One of the big top ones is obviously bef not, I guess, don't minimizing using your cell phone right in front of your face as you're in bed. If you don't have blue blocking glasses on, still not recommended. It does change your melatonin as far as production goes. So some of us unfortunately produce melatonin earlier in the evenings. So that signal of blue light coming from your cell phone is going to tell your brain to reduce production of melatonin. It can really shift your levels. There's some great information from Dr. Huberman about sleep, and I will share that with the group. So I am going to stop talking because